Mr. Shaw, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair Byron. Um, for those that don't know, my name is Robert Shaw. I'm a Deputy County Counsel for the County of Monterey County Council's Office, and we serve as General Counsel to the Authority through a contract. Um, you all went through a Brown Act training in August of 2018. <clears throat> Six months is not our normal uh, time frame in which to come back and do a new training, especially since there hasn't been any turnover. Um, but I do want to say... Oh, but there has. We, ha we have new counsel. That's true. <laughs> but I, I do want to say, I went back, I looked at the training that was done in August. I agree 100% with what Angela um, presented to all of you. Um, she did a fantastic job. Nothing I say tonight is intended to supplant or override anything that was in Angela's presentation, with, with the exception of the, the brown eggs graphic. <laughs> I don't know what that was. Um, you'll see I don't have any graphics. The goal here is to be ra relatively streamlined. The legal geeks um, like myself who are really interested in this sort of thing will think you, you've blown past some really important stuff. And I'll, I'll highlight it for you, but Angela did a really good job and they're going to be things that this council doesn't actually get into very often, like, like closed sessions. Um, what I do want to talk about is how under the Brown Act the council can operate outside of a meeting like this. Um, so what does your interaction look outside of that? We've got some questions during the holidays. We have a couple workshops coming up. So I wanted to take a moment, pause, and go over a few things with you. Um, it's already up here. So uh, just history of the Brown Act. In 1953, the San Francisco Chronicle did a 10-part series called Your Secret Government. After that, the legislative or the League of California Cities proposed to Senator Brown um, some guidelines that became the Brown Act. That's the history of it. And that really set up what our open meetings law is about, that they need to be open, they need to be accessible, but transparency, and, and I'll come back to this a few times, transparency isn't the end goal here. It's transparency, but it's also meaningful public participation. And, and you've seen tonight how important meaningful public participation is. Um, so those are, are really two overarching principles. Um, why is it important, and I have to confess I adapted this um, presentation from a colleague of mine, why it's important, yes, if we violate it, there could be misdemeanor violations for the individuals that violate it. Yes, violations will invalidate an action, but why is it really important? I think that that's a different thing than just what the penalties are. So moving past penalties, what I want to tell you is my favorite case. Um, as a legal geek, as a person that loves bicycles, my favorite case is a 1928 case called Noble versus the City of Palo Alto. In that case, there was a sheriff for the City of Palo Alto who wasn't directed to, but on his own time, directed his officers, and he himself collected bicycles from all over the city and took them back to City Hall and would collect them until at some point he could sell them. And he would sell these bicycles at, at intervals and keep all of the money himself. Um, in 1928, this was apparently acceptable. And because the Superior Court, um, when the city of Palo Alto said, no, that money should go in the public treasury, and the sheriff actually sued the city to say, no, this is my money. I collected this on my own time. I had my deputies do it. You didn't ask me to do it. It wasn't under my, my duties. Um, then he sued, and the Superior Court agreed. Um, but the Court of Appeal reversed that decision, and, and um, they could have gone about it in an, any number of ways, but what's important to me, and, and just as you can tell, this is not a Brown Act case, but what's important to me, and I'm going to read it because I, I find it so meaningful, the court said that there is neither a more wholesome nor sounder rule of law which re than that which requires public officers to keep themselves in such a position as that nothing shall tempt them to swerve from the straight line of official duty. The court said perception of wrongdoing, perception of conflict, perception is more important when you're a public official than whether you had the official authority to do what you're doing. If the perception is such, if we can't trust you in what you're doing, if you can be tempted because maybe you're incentivized to steal bicycles and to sell them, maybe you're incentivized to go outside the city limits and collect bicycles to sell them, if you're tempted, then we can't trust you as public officials. This is 1928, well before the Brown Act. But 
um, I think it, it gives a good, clear um, purpose for what the Brown Act stands for. And the Brown Act says, let's us as public officials sit in front of the public, engage them, give them an opportunity to participate, and not be tempted. We won't have any temptations of not being able to be completely transparent in what we're doing so that the issues in 1953 of secret government that the Chronicle was looking at, we don't, we're not tempted to fall into that trap. So it's just an important case to me personally, and I think uh, has some good rules that we can think about. The, this touches on a couple of, of basics, uh, regular and special meetings. What I, what I want to note here is that um, for special meetings, regular meetings, both require agendas, both require to be public with participation. What's important is, is here in terms of agenda additions. There can be agenda additions in regular meetings, but not in special meetings. If we had a special meeting, we can only hear what is actually on the agenda itself. And even for uh, agenda additions in a regular meeting, it's very unlikely that this council would be acting on an emergency or urgency basis. But if we did, we would, we would follow the rules, make the necessary findings. Um, public participation. Um, obviously, we've been through this. You all um, are very good here. We've talked a little bit about transparency and meaningful participation. What I want to talk about is public participation is limited to those items that are within, so not on the agenda, general public participation and comment, limited to items that are within the jurisdiction of the authority. So it's not an opportunity to talk about things that are of particular interest to you or what you're kids did that morning that you find interesting. It's what's within the jurisdiction of the authority. Um, here, you know, we've set a tone where we favor par public participation. We favor people having an opportunity to provide input even when it doesn't exactly fall within the, the four, four corners of what our jurisdiction is. Um, but still, it's, it's not a free-for-all. So I think you all in the chair have reached a, a really good balance point in there. Um, Reasonable regulations, I think this is one that, that again, I think the, the chair has struck a good balance. It's really um, regulations in, and restrictions on public comment geared towards making sure that everyone has a fair opportunity, that there aren't disruptions, everyone has a, a chance to speak to matters that are of importance to them. Um, I will say, you know, regulations can't prohibit people from providing criticism of the board. They can work to prevent disturbances, but things, disturbances have to interrupt or stop the business of the board. Um, so it, it really, you have to really push the line to get into to, to disturbances. I, the interesting case comes from uh, Los Angeles where an individual stood in the back of the room so no one could see him except for the, the council themselves, um, and he, you know, gave the, the one finger salute um, and held it there for a long time. And the, the chair at some point interrupted proceedings and has asked that individual to be removed. And that was wrong. He couldn't have done that. Um, it violated that person's right to, to attend the meeting and to criticize the board because he wasn't interrupting anything. He wasn't a distraction or a disturbance to anybody. So we have to have a thick skin, I suppose, is the takeaway there. Um, talking a little bit about what a meeting is, what I want to note here any congregation of the majority of members, it, it's this line here of at the same time or location. I think that's dangerous. This is exactly from the code, but I think that's dangerous. Um, when you look at the very next section, so 54952.2b1, what it says is you can have a meeting that's not at the same time and location. You're just at, in violation of the Brown Act if you do that without having it being agendized. So it, that's the serial meeting concern. So I don't want people to, to find safety in at the same time and location. That's a meeting. That's all we need to worry about because that, that's not what the Brown Act provides for. Um, it, 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 makes, it, it makes sense to pause and just talk about serial meetings real quick. We'll go over them in a second uh, again. But it's, it's the two rules that you all know. One, no j daisy chain communications. And that's A, talking to B, B, talking to C, C, talking to D. And the other, the hub, hub and spoke communications, where just like the wheel of a bicycle, my favorite mode of transportation, 
you have a single person acting as the hub and going out to all the various members to build a consensus. So reporting as to everybody's um, positions on a particular item and trying to build a consensus or take action outside of a notice agendized meeting. You know, controlling the meeting, I think we've covered a lot of this um, already, but I uh, should note it, just on the bottom here in terms of Robert rules, the CAC meeting um, bylaws don't actually require Robert's rules. We, we do kind of informally follow that process, but it's not a stringent requirement. Um, we'll spend a little bit of time on two slides from now. So um, what is a quorum? It's the majority of the members. It's six for you all. We have 11 members. We're going to 12, so our quorum will change whenever we get a member from Morro Bay and San Luis Obispo. Um, just to talk briefly about what happens if we lose a quorum. The meeting is effectively over because remember a meeting is a meeting of the majority of the members. So the meeting is over. We can't, we can no longer conduct business. There is a, a question about could you continue to have discussions. Um, a meeting would have deliberations, discussions, or conducting business, or taking votes, but it's no longer a meeting because you're less than the quorum. I think the best practice here is that you adjourn the meeting, nobody has any discussions. And the reason for that is that less than majority um, group could then have a conversation with, with a, another council member at a later time. Council member X, we all had this great conversation. You missed it, but this is what we agreed to. So when we get together next time, we'll vote on that. That could be a violation if what you're doing is building a consensus for a particular action outside of the noticed meeting. Talking a little bit about communications, this is where we're going to spend a little bit of time. Um, the exceptions to the quorum, having a majority of members in one location, really break down to individualized contacts. You can talk to one another on an individual basis, um, but you've got to be aware of that serial meeting violation. You can't collect information, try to build a consensus outside of the meeting, and you've got to be wary of going to the next uh, member or the person you talk to going to the next member because eventually you could have a rule where you're violating that majority number outside of a, a noticed meeting. Here we have six, we're going to seven, um, so there's a little bit of room to have those sorts of discussions for the county board of supervisors. You only have five, so you have a conversation with one other person, you only need one more before you're in violation. Um, citizen engagement. You can all talk to individual citizens, but again, you have to be weary of serial meetings because if that citizen has says, if he comes in and says, I've talked to six other council members, or I've talked to, more dangerous, five other council members, and what they think about this particular action is X, and boy, if we had you, then we'd get this passed. It's really up to you as the council member to stop that conversation before it becomes a serial meeting violation. Um, and that's, it can sometimes be difficult. It, it's a matter of steering that uh, conversation somewhere else or just saying, we can't have this conversation if what we're doing is trying to build a consensus outside of the meeting. It's just, and I, I think the public in general and these folks that, that uh, might solicit opinions from decision makers, uh, they're not offended by that. They know that that's coming. One would hope that they would stop trying to do that, but they don't always. Um, quorum exceptions in, in general. One is standing meetings. So if you have, um, you may appoint a standing committee. So if a standing committee is meeting and it's two or three members, something less than a quorum, other members can attend that standing meeting, um, but only as a participant, or I'm sorry, only as an observer. You can't participate in the conversation, um, even if it's, a, um, if, if it's your own board. Um, same is true of meetings of another legislative body. If, if this group wanted to attend the Board of Supervisors meeting for the County of Monterey, you absolutely could, but only as observers. Uh, a majority of you could not participate because of the, the danger that you could, through public participation, um, create a serial meeting outside of that. 
or, or engage in conversations or discussion with the Board of Supervisors about things that would fall within your jurisdiction. Um, and, and then here's the big one for what we talked about in December, which is social events and parties and things of that nature. So it, it's true, a majority of members can attend those things. And, and when I got the question in November, I said, there's a lot of nuance there. Let's, let's come back and talk a little bit about it. And the, and the nuance is, yes, you can attend parties um, when it's put on by somebody else. So this group creating a party, um, you know, a social event where people can come in and, and share uh, information, it, it becomes problematic because if, if it's a majority of the members, um, no conversations could cover anything that falls within the jurisdiction of the, the authority. Um, it would have to be open to the public, and presumably any conversations that were taking place would have to be publicly noticed. And then your party looks a lot like a meeting. Um, and part of that is because your relationship with one another is of public interest. It's the right of the public to know whether or not you all get along. Um, so things like that are dangerous from a Brown Act violation standpoint. It could be possible, um, but it's not advisable. Um, and, and of course, you have to be very aware of, of that serial meeting possibility. Um, the other exception, uh, I'll go back, just don't lose you on the next slide. The other exception is the closed session exception, and that's a very specific exception that, that we're unlikely to take advantage of here. There are certain circumstances when you can go into closed session. Um, you know, most of my work uh, here, if I'm gonna talk about it in a public setting, is, is likely to, be, or in a non-public setting, is likely to be in closed session as opposed to, to here at the dais. Um, but it's unlikely that we'll go there with this, this body. Um, the, the role of staff, I, I put this in because some conversations uh, and comments came up in the August training about scheduling and things like that. The Brown Act actually provides that you can contact staff and for scheduling purposes. That's not a, a Brown Act violation. You do have to be worry of, weary of email, um, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, the other thing is staff can come to each of you individually and provide information and answer questions. but again you have to be weary of that serial meeting potential um, the best practice is that it's a one-way flow of information staff is answering your questions staff is providing you information you're not um, engaging staff in questions about where other people may be what their concerns may be on a particular issue because that dialogue is is to happen here with the public present and, and able to participate um, this, this, we've talked about this. I had it originally at the end. I thought it was important to put it at the beginning, so we've touched on this. And, and the one thing I want to note is, while, you know, it's very easy to say it's daisy chain is A to B, B to C, C to D. It doesn't have to be that rigid. Um, of course, it can be someone has talked to three or four people and then brings in two more people in separate conversations. So it could be a hybrid between these two things. Um, and, and I just want to note that for you all. Uh, talking about email, um, reply all is one of those things. Like you, you've got to be careful with the potential of reply all. I think Bren does a good job of trying to use um, carbon copy so that people can't reply all. Um, but what I want to talk about a little bit is beyond email, just what social media has done to the Brown Act. Um, it's made it a very dangerous area for you all to be able to participate in conversations, whether it's on Facebook. Uh, or Twitter or Instagram, um, these things can all create a potential Brown Act violation. Um, the Supreme Court has said that a like on Facebook is, for, is speech. So if someone posts a comment on Facebook and someone else likes it um, and someone else comments again, at some point you may be having a discussion that would be in violation of the Brown Act. Again, it's six members, not three, so uh, examples are, are sometimes long-winded to come up with, but it's a potential. The same thing about Instagram. Um, photos are speech, obviously. So a photo, a, a like of that photo, comments on that photo could create uh, dialogue. Um, and it's an interesting thing for me. Twitter is another one that 
tweeting, retweeting, liking a tweet. I don't know actually know how Twitter works. We'd have to bring in like a 14 year old to really explain it to us or at least me. Um, but it's dangerous. And it's, it's interesting because it gets back to this question of transparency and meaningful participation. I think a really good argument can be made that Facebook and Twitter are super transparent. It's immediately engaging the public in conversations that might be very important to the public and to the business of this, this council. But is it really meaningful? Is that the place that you really have meaningful debate and conversation? Um, the Brown Act uh, has set it up such that meaningful participation means notice, an opportunity to be heard, um, and an opportunity to participate. So maybe face, maybe the Brown Act isn't quite ready for social media, but I want to raise it for you all because I think email gets talked a lot about because in the business community we use it, but I think more and more um, public officials, um, <laughs> some very prominent public officials are moving to social uh, media platforms to really get their message out. And it can be a dangerous environment if you're um, governed under the California Brown Act. Um, so I wanted to raise oh, one more. Again, I don't know how this works exactly, but Snapchat, the conversations disappear. So <laughs> did it really happen if no one can prove it? And, and the one thing I want to note is apparently you can prove that Snapchat is there as, as uh, some young man in Santa Cruz just found out as he was advertising his, his drug selling app on Snapchat. Um, they, nothing goes away forever in the digital age. So I think that's a, an important one to note. Um, so that is really the end of my presentation. I promised it would be quick uh, and leave you enough time for any questions. Any questions? I, I just wanted to add that all emails and text messages are also available through subpoena uh, if we get into some sort of Brown Act violation. So everyone should be very careful about text messages also. I think that's, that's a very important point, and, and not just through subpoena, but the Public Records Act as well. I didn't cover that here, but um, if you're using your personal devices um, for work that is covered by, you know, your role here as council members, um, that is subject to a Public Records Act request and can be um, collected and reviewed and provided to the public. Any other questions? Mr. Osmer. Oh, so, sorry, Mr. Asmus Keita. So if we are five members here and we're discussing anything on, on the community um, for this agency, we're not breaking the Brown Act, right? Only if we're over six? If you're less than five members, you don't have a quorum, so you're not a meeting. You can't take any official action. Can you, you're not a meeting, so can you discuss? Uh, I think you can discuss, but there's a danger there. And the danger is that any one of those five, you may be a very good council member and know where the Brown Act line is and, and be able to control your conversations, but you can't control necessarily the other four conversations that might happen. So any one of those individuals could talk to another person and there would be a violation. Thank you. Mr. Osmer. Well, I've actually been uh, uh, been involved in a number of uh, Brown Act violations, and I was going to tell some <laughs> stories, but it's getting kind of late, so I'm, I'm going to refrain. Uh, but most of those violations were during closed sessions when attorneys are not so uh, straightforward about uh, calling out violations. Um, but, you know, for me, uh, you know, the Brown Act, the big thing about the Brown Act is that what it says is that um, the people do not give their public servants the right to tell the people what is good for them to know or what is not good for them to know. So for me, it's like a, it's an open thing is all the business that, uh, you know, you, we are conducting the people's business and they have a right to know what we're doing. And that's, and that's very, very open. And, and that's what I always keep in mind about the Brown Act. Mm. Yeah, I, I think Good that counsel. is exactly right. And I, and I would just encourage um, everyone to also think about the participation aspect of it, um, that it has to be able to be meaningful um, participation by the public. Um, 
I, I will add one more comment. We'll open it up to public comment. Uh, just to give you all some context, uh, Ms. Levan and I, uh, uh, in conjunction with uh, Mr. Killigrew, were preparing the agenda for the March 30th workshop. Um, and uh, we're going to do some breakout sessions there on three different topics. Um, I think they're all listed in the brochure. Uh, and we'll have a chance to divide up and go to different meetings. And we want to make sure there's plenty of opportunity, not just to hear from the public, but to be able to engage and have that f open discussion um, with the public. Um, so the idea was uh, we'll try and divide up. We may or may not have a quorum in one of those rooms. And so we're going to go ahead and notice the meeting so that you can have that discussion and feel free to talk. So that's how this, I think, really precipitated. And, and we wanted to make sure, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Shaw wanted to make sure we were all clear on the Brown Act before we did our workshop on the 30th. And I will turn to you and ask, is there anything else you want to add or correct about what I just said? No, I, I think that's a perfect summary. I think the, the discussion was, how can we make sure that we're maximizing par public participation and bring down kind of the formal walls that, that the Brown Act, oddly enough, creates um, by requiring notice meetings and a noticed agenda items. Um, and as we went through that process, it became clear the best way to do it is to actually comply with the Brown Act, to make it a special meeting where the only agenda item is the workshop itself. However, we will not be making any decisions or taking any action at that meeting. There's nothing like that on the agenda. Right. It, it, it is just the, the, the members of this board will attend that workshop. The workshop itself will, will go on somewhat independent from the special meeting, but it is the only thing happening at the special meeting. Okay, so does that mean that we don't have to worry about how many people are in each breakout group? It, um, yes, and yet yes. there's nuance. Um, we wanted depends. a no answer there. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. The it, it will depend how many people are in the breakout sessions, but that's an interesting one because um, we'll be coming back and reporting out what happened in those breakout sessions. But I think the the one the public is invited to participate. All of those breakout sessions will be agendized as part of the special meeting, um, so the public can participate in those breakout sessions and in the reporting out. Um, so I think we've complied with the Brown Act in in that respect. But I think it, it's a good practice to, um, we probably don't have the numbers actually to have more than a quorum in the breakout, but it'd be a good practice to divide us up. Unless one of those um, breakouts is really interesting and the other ones are a little less so and everybody wants to go sit in on I'm sure line. that will not be the case. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure Mark and JR are working to make sure all of them are equally interesting and cutting edge. Okay. So so, um, uh, and, and you'll all be glad to know that I will not be running that meeting. Staff will be running it, so it be sure to finish on time. It'll be, <laughs> it's from 9, 9 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. at the Watsonville Civic Center on March 30th, and I hope you can be there. So, I will go ahead, if it's okay, and open it up to public comment. Mm -hmm. Any members of the public? Seeing none. Um, thank you very much.